Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, um, good evening, or perhaps even good night these days. Uh, thank you, the organizers of, uh, of the conference, for inviting me to um, talk to you about brain lens intelligence, in particular biological agents exploring uh, space in networks. I would uh, rather divide the, the presentation in four parts. First, we need to talk a little bit about background and some definitions. Then uh, we look into biological algorithms for space searching by microorganisms. Then we will move to biosimulation and uh, perhaps the most exciting part will be biocomputation. So stay with me until the end. We'll finalize with uh, conclusions, perspectives, and uh, of course, acknowledgements. The first bit, uh, setting the background and some definitions. From the very beginning, I would want to point out that these are uh, the definitions uh, are, are not prescriptive. So it is important to put uh, the, the question, but um, we shouldn't progress too much in imposing a, a, an answer. So we do not want to use our Buddha nature, to do it. So with that, uh, let's uh, have a chat about uh, what is intelligence. Now, there are many definitions. It depends who you ask. And as a matter of fact, when I ask my students and sometimes in conferences, when I ask the audience, how many do you think you are intelligent? I have more um, uh, hands raised to uh, answer this question rather than how many of you do know what intelligence is. As before, we do not want to uh, get the answer to this question. Or to, to that discrepancy. Now, many definitions are there. So uh, some people figure out that are at least 70. And I like uh, uh, the, the, the last uh, two, that is uh, intelligence would be an agent ability to achieve goals in a wide range of environments. And the second one, which says that intelligence doesn't like to be trapped. Uh, but by the way, all these definitions and many others uh, have been picked from Wikipedia. So if you may, we may um, um, agree that we have intelligence with a small i, which is optimal behavior in, the, in various uh, space settings and you know, at some time. And intelligence with capital I would be the same for a wider range of um, the settings, environments, and for a longer the time range and using the learning, what had been learned from, from previous experience. Um, well, by the way, you might have noticed things in red, and there are definitions that are not necessarily anthropomorphic. It would apply to almost anything that, uh, that is alive. The next question would be, um, now, what is computation? Uh, from Latin, computing is about numbers. But obviously, um, that has been extended to um, some heuristics and, and all. So again, for the purposes of this presentation, would we want to, to narrow or clarify what we are talking about? And I propose that we are talking about computing. Uh, that would be a process when there are numbers in and numbers out, like uh, what you see on, on the red path or we are talking about simulations where the input and output is not necessarily numeric. Um, it could be as in it is in our case and a couple of others, uh, it could be images. And interestingly more about the etymology of computer, you can find that this very interesting page. Finally, well, not finally, but progressing on, on the background and definitions, um, what life is that? Now, some time ago, I started reading a book um, that I didn't finish because it is about AI and uh, we have limited time. But the, the perspective that it gives, it was very, very interesting uh, to uh, what we are talking about here. So what, uh, what the author proposes is that we have three stages of life. So life 1.0 is uh, biological. That is, for instance, bacteria they um, they uh, can survive and replicate and uh, they cannot design the software because the software is built in the DNA and it cannot be changed uh, uh, but it 
will be changed through generations by evolutions. And uh, certainly the hardware cannot, cannot be uh, changed. Now, I think that this is not entirely true. We do know that in some instances, uh, organisms can change the software on the fly without um, uh, need for a culture or something. The environment uh, does uh, change uh, the software from time to time, and even hardware. OK, and certainly um, now we humans, we can uh, change our software through education. But these days, we can, I think, uh, it is questionable that we cannot change the hardware. We just started to change the hardware. I guess that many of us have been vaccinated with um, uh, mRNA. So this uh, classification, it is very useful as a start of the discussion. And the questions, by the way, are mine, not, not the authors. So I take responsibility for that. Um, moving further, OK, what are the agents that we are scratching our head on how intelligent they are or, or they are not? So uh, interestingly, all agents must move. So intelligence imposes that there is a movement. And in biology, um, the movement is, uh, we like it or not, linked in a way or other with uh, protein molecular motors. Uh, many instances, linear molecular motors, but also uh, rotary motors. And uh, th these are not presented here, but in our work, we use uh, linear molecular motors. Other than that, if we go one step up in complexity, uh, not that far away, we are talking about fungi and we are talking about, um, about bacteria and we use about five species of fungi and, um, and uh, mutants, and we use five species of uh, bacteria. They are incredibly different in, in architecture, not that much sizes, perhaps Magnetococcus minus in the middle is a little bit fatter, but the rest are about one micron uh, or whereabouts. So they are quite different in architecture. Um, okay. Now, moving further on the experimental side of, uh, of, if you like, the methods that we use in our, in our uh, experiments and studies, we need to have a word about mazes. Mazes have been used for decades, uh, uh, perhaps even centuries in Greek math mythology for testing uh, the intelligence of almost anything that moves. Uh, let's try the ends as well. So, uh, uh, but, but I have to say that these uh, systems uh, are, they, they have a brain, okay, be that an artificial or natural one. Mazes have been used also more recently uh, for, um, for testing the intelligence, if you like, or sometimes not expressed like that, of slime molds and, uh, and uh, bacteria. But I need to point out that. Uh, in all these instances, and I will return to, to this point, in all these instances, uh, these organisms, as opposed to the previous uh, examples, had some clues of, um, uh, that helped them uh, negotiate uh, the confining environments. And that is not necessarily uh, fair in testing the intelligence. Uh, moreover, uh, moving on on the experimental details, we use quite often the, the same structures to test uh, a, a very simple uh, behavior, but then we, are, we escalate to mazes and, and the like. And uh, almost everyone here would know how to do soft lithography. We are designing the structures, we put them face down, and we allow the agents explore them, and we observe what is going on, followed by uh, image analysis, uh, statistics, uh, and the mathematical processing. Finally, <clears throat> what we are, um, what we need to have a bird's eye view on, on what we are doing here. So uh, I would point out that that we, as an organizing principle, we would need to answer, not to answer, but to take this assumption: who is the smart guy in the room? So either we at the top, we can 
um, recognize that they are the smart guys, that the, the biological systems that they are looking, they are smart and we want to learn from them. So in that sense, we were after the biological algorithms that are driving the information processing of these uh, biological systems. Uh, at the bottom, at the other end of the spectrum, we are the guy, the smart guys in the room. So we we design the, the environment and we need the biological systems to operate on our behalf to, to solve the problems that we want to solve. And somewhere in between, it is uh, it is an interesting overlap, but we have to be clear here so we would remember that we are talking biosimulation now as opposed to computation where we would use the biological algorithms or biological or multi-biological systems to explore uh, networks that mimic uh, some um, problem that a real problem that we have for instance uh, uh, most of the time traffic uh, be that rails or, or highways or net. So with that, we will start in earnest um, and we, the part one will be about uh, assuming that uh, they are the smart guys in the room. We will talk about biological armories for space surgery, first fungi and uh, then later bacteria. Okay, fungi first. So this is a uh, representation of uh, more than 10 years old uh, experiments when we tested the behavior of uh, fungus from Australia in uh, mazes and we were mesmerized uh, and the, 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 the watching this uh, fungi exploring mazes is nearly addictive. But what we learned is that uh, they, they, they very interesting, we, we work with five species now already and what we learn is that they all of them have a master program for space searching that has that that and that master program has two um, subroutines okay one on the left is what we call collision induced branching and the other one on the right the representation on the right is uh, directional memory and um, uh, just to clarify, for instance, uh, up you have uh, on the right, uh, top right, you have the collision induced branching, meaning that uh, HIFA will negotiate left, right, or whatever, but when it gets to a dead end or something that will uh, obligate to a more than 90 degrees uh, U-turn near, it will send a branch, but not before. And uh, if it can move, it will move happily ever after uh, for quite a long while. Uh, obviously, in uh, confined environments, because the collision in the, uh, collision occurs quite often, there are also uh, uh, a lot of branching, as opposed to in the open, where the branching is much 10 times at the very more rare. Directional memory is uh, <laughs> something quite interesting. Um, saying that, that the Haifa would uh, reach a wall and it would be obligated to change the direction. But once that it's free, it will continue in the same direction that it had before colliding with the wall. It will not continue uh, into the direction of the wall. So it, it does have a, a, a memory, which is nearly freaky. It is very interesting. So with that, uh, the memory in itself now that we talked uh, that perhaps intelligent with capital I would include uh, the memory. Uh, here you see on the top uh, a, a branching and each the parent and the branch will keep their directional memory, but perhaps even more interesting is that that angle of attack uh, keeps on and on be the same, even if it is so far away from the initial one and there are many structures in between. So it, it has more than 100 meters, which is many, many times larger than the size of uh, the diameter of the hive. So the, the, they do have quite a long memory. That, that's the point. Um, with that understanding of um, the biological algorithms, uh, the fungal biological algorithm, uh, we run stochastic simulations. So what we learn is that 
this uh, the biological, uh, uh, not arguing, biological program is very justified biologically. So the, if, if the fungus is using this algorithm, it can get out of uh, mazes, quite complicated, as you see on the right, in more than 90% of the time. And then we, if we suppress the directional memory, the performance goes down drastically, more on one type of maze than the rest. And if we suppress the collision-induced branching, well, it is still, it is not that bad, but still it is worse. And if we suppress both of them, in some instances, in some type of mazes, we have uh, a similar of performance, but in others, we, the performance is abysmal. So what it says uh, is that if the fungus is using the, algo, the program that it has, it can cover evenly the space and therefore find the exits when they are available, like you see the, the covering of the space on the far left. Um, uh, exploration of the maze, as opposed to the top right is just a random walk. The uh, next to left is when the uh, directional memory is suppressed, and that looks that it is quite bad. And uh, the second one, uh, the third moving from the left is uh, when uh, the collision induced is uh, suppressed. It is not that bad, but nevertheless, it, it doesn't compare with the natural algorithm. Now, the next question would be, okay, so this is biologically justified. Um, what are the, what is the hardware that is behind this software that we know it is biologically efficient? So the school of thought in, uh, in uh, fungal biology says that there are two, or two mechanisms that, uh, that are responsible for uh, fungal growth. One is, one is the uh, turgor pressure. So the, the, the fungus has more pressure inside, osmotic pressure inside than outside, and that is like blowing air in a balloon. And indeed, you can see that the fungus uh, the, at the bottom, it negotiates the, the, the narrow uh, channel there, and it is quite confined, but the moment that it gets out, that very moment it branches, it is like, like the, the, build, the result of the buildup of the pressure inside of Haifa. So this is the turgor pressure, which apparently uh, controls, it is the hardware behind the collision induced branching. The more interesting I have to say is uh, what is behind the directional memory. So here you have, you see that the red dot there, it is the Spitzenkorper, which is uh, a, a, a group of vesicles that uh, operates like a sort of a gyroscope of the fungus. And it, is, it has the memory of the direction that it had initially. So it is pushing up, as you see in this video now, uh, on the wall, although there, there is no possibility to go there. And eventually when it is uh, in the open now, turning the corner, it moves again in the middle, again at the 45 degrees. And everything is supported by uh, by the cytoskeleton uh, microtubules are kind of org uh, enforcing this uh, directionality and, and this memory. And interesting now that we know that there are two hardware pieces that are supporting each of these two software, they are obviously cooperating with each other, but at times they fight each other. So here we have an example where the directional memory is totally useless and uh, counterproductive, as a matter of fact. So what it happens, it is just the turbo pressure, which it is uh, uh, anisotropic, uh, sorry, isotropic, and, and the directional memory, the hardware for directional memory is turned off when it is not useful. So once the, the branches are there, each branch uh, would have its own directional memory. So it's very interesting that most of the time directional memory has the upper hand, but there are instances when it doesn't work, the, the other hardware is taking control of, of, of uh, the growth. Now, we learned how it works, hardware and software, but 
what is in it for us. So then we even extended the uh, research in trying to see how efficient is that algorithm in situations outside biology. So what we tried here, we tried to use the, we, we did use the biological algorithm, so bio-inspired algorithm uh, here, compared with uh, uh, a classical uh, uh, maze searching algorithm, DFS, and another one, uh, heuristic determination of the minimum cost. Now, the biological algorithm beats the DFS anytime and it beats better the larger the maze. It does not beat the heuristic determination of minimum cost, but that one has prior knowledge about the maze. And this is how it calculates the, the minimum cost. So uh, the fungus doesn't know what is the maze in front of it. And therefore, I think we demonstrated that there are certain instances where the biological algorithms are performing better than uh, human-made uh, ones. So this is the take-home message from here. Now, um, moving on um, to bacteria. Okay, so if fungi are smart, uh, what about bacteria? Well, by the way, fungi are sort of very distant cousin of us and bacteria they are way, way different than, than all of us. So here we played with, in the first instance, we played in, with bacteria in what we call open spaces. They are not that open. They are 100 microns by 100 microns. And the, the, in the first, you can see immediately they are, uh, they are moving, the, <laughs> how they partition on um, uh, these five species, how they partition space and explore space is incredibly different. And initially we thought, well, mm, perhaps this is, there is something to do with the, with the architecture that they have. And um, I would just uh, close your eyes and uh, put your bets, who would solve the mazes better? of all of this and uh, being recorded i would not have an answer later on that i do not want to use my buddha nature okay so moving into the statistics of it on the left far left column you see the the distribution of the bacteria in open spaces for six microns height uh, plazas, as we call them, on four microns. So the, the, if if the uh, environment is kind of pressed, there is not much to to uh, to allow the biological algorithms to develop. So working with six microns would be better to allow um, these biological algorithms manifest themselves. So what you see on the column C are uh, um, uh, geometries of the trajectories and you can see easily that they are really, really, really very different. And, um, and from here, if we move further, if we want to organize a little bit what's going on, we follow in the footsteps of, of one of our colleagues now at the University of Waterloo, who derived from the very first principles, the behavior of a bacterium, but only if it is very, very simple uh, monoflagellate. And he figured out that if you know the width A1 and the length of, um, uh, sorry, the A1 is the length of the cell uh, divided by the width. And if you have the length of the flagellum, then you can uh, assume, you, you can predict how it will behave and the behavior are either wall followers or well escapers. Either the, the bacteria will move at the wall and stay on the wall or they are, once they find the world, they will move out of the world. And there are, of course, others that are moving heavily above the um, parallel to the world. So we extended that uh, 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 result to much more complex uh, bacteria. And we learned that actually, uh, it, for good reason, regardless of the very fundamental and very complicated uh, movement that they have with much more complex uh, architecture, by and large, they uh, either wall followers and well escapers, as you see on on the B image, um, you see a wall follower, 
but interestingly enough, it moves, it switches from one world to the other, and others move happily about in the middle uh, that is parallel to the world. Uh, and then we complicated, uh, we, we started to complicate a little bit uh, their life. And here we are testing uh, the movement of uh, bacteria, the five species, in, um, in uh, comb-like uh, channels. And if the channel is narrow, well, there is not much that you can do but to negotiate. So the, the, it is like um, giving clues where to go. There is not much you can do about but to get to the other end. Of course, there, there are uh, trappings on the way. If the channel is large, again, it doesn't appear to be a problem because uh, you can use the pelagic uh, way of movement. The problem is with the mesoscale channels where you, the bacteria apparently doesn't know what to do, doesn't know which of the two algorithms to use, and they are conflicting with each other. And by the way, that can be used to trap, um, to trap uh, individual uh, cells. Moving a little bit up uh, in complexity, again, we are returning to uh, uh, testing intelligence with mazes. And here you have uh, example trajectories of E. coli. And suddenly we use all five species. And what we learned is that they are indeed they are very different, very different again. Uh, there are five different uh, algorithms who would lead to very, very different uh, performance uh, in, uh, in mazes. And you see here, you think that the, the architecture is something that makes them the same, but I have to say that, uh, look at the top, E. coli and Vibrion antigens, they cannot be more different. Vibrion antigens has uh, one flagellum, E. coli has flagella everywhere, up, up front, back, on, on the sides. And nevertheless, they are behaving quite similarly as opposed to others. So E. coli would be more like uh, Pseudonomas putida in architecture, but they are in incredibly different. Okay. So further on, if we compare in more detail, uh, three species, uh, Magnetogos, Marinos, Putida, and Vibrio fisheri, they are not E. coli and Vibrio antigens. We see now that even Magnetococcus marinos is an incredibly fast the velocity of more than 60, uh, most of the time microns per second. If you do not pay attention, you, you do not see it in, in the field of view. Uh, is moving, say, comparing with, uh, say, Putida is moving at least two times faster, but the time to solve the mazes is the same. And the distance that is, uh, is using to escape from the maze is uh, three times uh, higher. So velocity, uh, speed of calculations, if you like, it is not uh, the most important thing by far, okay? Now, uh, moving uh, further to part number two, we are talking now about biosimulations. So almost everyone knows uh, of incredibly profound work from uh, the Nakagaki's group. And uh, here, uh, I am just borrowing from uh, his uh, science paper where uh, Fisarum slime mold uh, was used to um, to simulate the overall distribution of the rail network in Japan around Tokyo. Again, uh, here, positive taxis, chemo taxis, has been used to, to teach, if you like, or to give uh, hints to Visarum where it should go. Okay. And uh, also, in order to um, to mimic the uh, landscape, the mountains and all, uh, negative taxis have been used in particular light to, um, to uh, discourage the, 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 uh, the slime mold to explore some spaces. So it is not, it is in a sense, it is quite the opposite of um, mazes, but more importantly, one, it, it needs clues to get out, or, or to optimize the geometry. And, uh, and the other thing it is, and that is very important for our discussion here, it is just one organism, okay? It is an overall 
uh, we do not see the trains here. We do not see the, the cars, okay, in, the, in this network. We do not see individual agents. Well, if that is the case, um, well, it's really this. When you have no source of production, agent, more of the buses, people, I think there is a dog somewhere. And you see that it's more traffic like that. And uh, obviously that would be difficult to do it with a slime mold. So what we thought then, okay, if this is the case, what would be the system that we want to, to use here? And actually, we thought that Venice is a good example. By the way, the students would very much like to go there to collect uh, data uh, from the field. So there are Venice is an interesting case because it has two networks. One is the Telehal network with 900 nodes and the pedestrian network with 10,000 nodes, much more complicated. So we fabricated all sorts of mini mazes of Venice on the chip, if you like. And um, now with EP lithography and the reactive ion aging. And the problem that we have with the, with the canal network is that, well, in Venice, the gondolas do not go into the sea, but the, our bacteria that mimic the gondolas and the boats do go in the sea, they, they want to go there. So there are limitations there. The pedestrian network is much easier to simulate because it is much closed system. So all the people are coming on the causeway. You do not have cars or anything, but it is much more difficult because it has 10 times, or more than 10 times the nodes, it is much more difficult to uh, simulate and to fabricate. So here you have uh, the designs. Um, uh, on the left, it is the actual design of the uh, Venice on the chip. And in the middle, you have uh, the bright field and the fluorescence for, um, for um, 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 boats moving in, uh, in uh, channels, in canals as, as they are. And then from there, we can uh, get the, uh, the density, the distribution, the overall distribution of uh, these agents, very similar with uh, what you would have gotten from um, from uh, Fisarum, but also we can analyze individual agents as well. So with that, um, uh, then how is that compared with uh, our with the reality? So here we have on the far right we have. Um, the uh, real life uh, traffic data. So it was quite a, a deep study of the noise pollution that we used to uh, benchmark our experiments. And on the left, you see the distribution of um, bacteria in uh, the four different uh, settings. Um, on, the, on the D you have the, the boats are allowed to go into the sea and in the others, uh, they are not. So with that, um, the comparison that we have here with the real data and our, on our data, you see that they, they, uh, if, if the intensity of, of the pixels, this is how we compare it. So you see that, uh, that we could uh, quite, we have quite a good uh, uh, replication of the, of, the, of the traffic situation. And from here, we are working now to create uh, disasters, if you like, okay. Uh, traffic jams and uh, the canals that uh, are closed or whatever it is. And um, watch this space because we will have much more to show in, in a short time. Now, uh, moving to the third part and perhaps the most interesting is uh, we we'll talk about biocomputation and computing with mobile agents and in our case, bacteria. Now, <clears throat> most mathematical problems are either solvable or unsolvable, if you like. And uh, NP complete standing for non, um, uh, non uh, polynomial uh, uh, problems. There are problems that um, non deterministic uh, polynomial problems. There are problems where th th that NP complete problem is a problem where the time to solve the problem goes exponentially with the size of the problem. So, um, 
therefore the the electronic computers who are essentially uh, sequential they are very fast and very precise but they will fail well or it will take a lot a lot of time as you will see in 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 a, in a minute so therefore we thought ah what if we take the mathematical problem which is many of them there are about 80 NP complete problems these days many of them can be easily or they are already defined as a graph okay and then we take the graph and we use that to make a network the difference is that the the, the in a network the distance between the nodes has a dimension in graphs they do not so we have dim dimensions between length between nodes and perhaps in if it is a, a true um, network microfluidics in our uh, in, in our case you will need to have width and height as well so then uh, we fabricate this network and we allow uh, as many agents we can afford to explore that network and they will get out in the pool of solutions okay so uh, examples of np complete problems uh, we worked uh, uh, much more with knapsack problem where you have a set of of objects if you like and you uh, operate with them you add them but they have to be exactly uh, fit the your knapsack okay and uh, that looks kind of very simple but if you are going to 30 objects or 50 objects uh, there is no way that you can explore all possibilities. Uh, certainly, if you are a burglar and you want to steal these things, you are uh, short of time. Okay, so we work with um, with a knapsack problem, and we figure out that uh, we can make the we can make the the uh, the network here, and we have two types of nodes: uh, the split junction where uh, things are moving uh, uh, left or right and past junctions. But more perhaps you will learn from the next video. The bacterial computation of solutions to NP complete problems is operated in microfluidic networks fabricated using graph theory based designs. Here, a subset sum problem SSP network is shown. The network components include a bacterial inlet point, bacterial exits, which represent the target zones, and bacterial traps for catching ghost traffic. In this network, the bacterial agents encounter a specific junction at plus 1, plus 3, and plus 4, known as a split junction. Bacterial agents entering split junctions encounter spots where the traffic lines split, green pointers, past red pointer, or join yellow pointers. The split junctions perform addition of the set integers. Bacteria have a 50 to 50 chance of proceeding either to the left starting an addition operation or to the right, skipping the addition. Any path other than left or right is considered a wrong path, resulting from U-turns or other illegal turns. The path junction is a perpendicularly angled devil crossing. The bacterial agent entering the path junction should continue its direction without turning. Any other path like Q-turns or other illegal turns is a wrong path leading to errors in the computation. The network also contains joint junctions. These can be found in all split junctions and at the exit points of the network. Joint junctions are only active when a target sum exit can be reached by multiple routes. In such a case, 
we call the network a complexity class 2 network. In this SSP instance 134 network, the possible subsets sum up to the exits 0, 1, 3, 4, 5, 7, and 8. Exit number 4 can be reached by more than one route, 0, 0, 4, and 1, 3, 0. Hence, the SSP-134 network is a complexity class 2 network. Other than the exit solution 4, the exits 0, 1, 3, 5, 7, and 8 can only be reached by one route. Exit 2 and exit 6 do not correspond to possible subset sums. Bacterial agents reach the exit in parallel by stochastic turning left to right at split junctions, but further following the traffic rules at the split and pass junctions. For visiting the exit solution 0, the bacteria should take three right turns at the consecutive split junctions at position plus 1, plus 3, and plus 4, leading to the exit solution 0. In a similar way, all other routes are explored by the bacteria in an SSP network. Bacterial multiplication in the network makes computation faster by reducing the time taken by a new agent to enter the network and explore the new path. An example of bacterial movement with simultaneous multiplication at the split junction position plus one is shown where the offspring of a single bacterium would explore two different paths leading to the exit 5 and the exit 8. Some illegal turns at split or pass junctions can lead bacteria to visit incorrect subset sum exits like exit 2 or exit 6. Many illegal turns in the network, however, will lead to guiding the bacteria to the traps of the periphery of the network. Having entered the square trap, bacteria cannot re-enter the network. Such traps are also found at the exits of the network to prevent the bacteria that completed the calculation from re-entering the network. Okay, so uh, I think you understand what we are talking about. The, the, the interest, the important part is uh, what are the the errors here, so that requires quite a lot of uh, optimization of the junctions and the angles and, and all, but um, the, the pass junctions are much more important than the split junctions and uh, they, they need really to be nearly 100% uh, precise. Well, the split junctions we can live with 51, 49. Um, obviously, the computer is much more complicated than, than that, and uh, th there is a lot of infrastructure around other than the, the, the ghost uh, uh, channels. We have uh, rectifiers uh, uh, forcing the agents not to return into the uh, computer, to uncompute, if you like. And in the first instance, we work with the protein molecular motors, be that um, uh, acting filaments uh, propelled by myosin or microtubules propelled by kinesin. And this is one of the first movies where we have uh, uh, microtubules here, they are the right. Uh, interestingly, the, the, the roof is not there. So, so this is where we have um, uh, agents that landed on the, on the top of, of, um, of the computer, but we can get rid of them uh, by image analysis and processing. Uh, moving on, uh, we thought, okay, if, um, if division is the key to have a faster calculation, what not we're using uh, bacteria? Of course, you can attempt to uh, multiply the, um, the acting filaments of microtubules. This is what is happening in, in us all the time. But the protocols, they are quite complicated, whereas bacteria uh, do divide by themselves without much fuss. So we use E. coli and the, the results were quite encouraging, leading us to go to, in a sense, we have a sort of Moore's law um, 
that we are pushing and we are uh, getting larger and larger computations. Uh, and uh, as we speak, we, we are competing with the electronic computers. Now, um, uh, then how, if, if this is nice and tidy, how would that compare with, uh, with other methodologies? So here we have uh, what we uh, estimated, the computing time. So what you have here, uh, you have the electronic computers that are going, the time goes exponentially, as I mentioned before, with the cardinality, that is the size of the problem. And uh, we have a, a slow start with bacterial computers because you need to allow them in. The booting takes a lot of time, it is a serial process, but if you have, if you allow a number of bacteria in and you allow them to, um, to replicate is like starting the computer with a number of CPUs and the larger the problem the CPUs will divide on and on and on. So this is where we believe that the, the calculation time will go logarithmically not exponentially uh, with the size of the problem and then we are home. Quantum computers are obviously way better than classical computers but nevertheless they are still exponential uh, in time, uh, and uh, there is a famous uh, Grover uh, uh, theorem that uh, shows that if uh, an electronic computer can solve it in 100 years, a quantum computer will solve it in 10. Um, then how do we go with uh, energy? Well, here, uh, oh, by the way, returning the DNA computation will solve the problem instantaneously, so there is no doubt about it uh, there. But when we turn to energy, well, things are more complicated. For biocomputation, the type of problem uh, gives you what is the evolution of the energy with the size of the problem. But for if we talk about prime numbers, uh, well, for medium size uh, MP complete problem, uh, the energy consumption uh, is uh, molecular motors uh, per up perhaps the, the fastest, bacteria a little bit less, uh, quite comparable with DNA and electronic and quantum computers have orders of magnitude away in energy that they need to use for computation. Finally, um, and this is what uh, kind of uh, put a lid on uh, DNA computation, uh, what is the mass or the volume, if you like, of the agents that need to solve this uh, problem? Obviously for electronic and quantum computers, this is not an issue. And that is the, the bright side of having serial computers. It, the volume stays the same and it is really very small. But for DNA computers, the volume goes up massively and for bacterial computers as well, but it is tolerable for even for large problems. So you are talking about 10 liters or less, whereas for DNA computers, we can talk about a square, not a square, uh, uh, cubic uh, kilometer. So with that, some conclusions, uh, biological algorithms, um, they do evolve uh, space searching algorithms that are, they are very biologically efficient and in some instances they are also even better than, than ours and um, the harvesting of natural information is, is warranted or perhaps overdue. In biosimulation, the microorganisms can either mimic complex traffic, and that, that would give us an idea about what to do, or alternatively, or how we can design the traffic better, traffic networks better, or if they do not mimic how we behave, perhaps we can learn how, how to behave uh, better. Uh, the, and this is because large-scale experiments with humans are, are impossible in many ways. Biocomputation, uh, finally, um, the biological agents, if in large numbers, offer a sporting chance of solving NP complete problems that are intractable for DNA and electronic computers for different reasons, and possibly even quantum computers. Thank you very much for your attention. In the end, I would <clears throat> want to acknowledge the many people that work on these studies in Australia, in UK, uh, and now Canada, and uh, many people that worked with uh, us in uh, European consortia, Monad and Abacus respectively, as well as uh, many people who contributed with ideas and, uh, and
and uh, support uh, Abley, Clive Edwards, Silver Martel, Henry Hess, Nick Reed, Leonard Levan, and Rada Matkin, and uh, Toshina Papaki. Thank you for your attention.